lecturing at Jadavpur University, where he was a gold medalist in his batch. Uh, he is passionate about fluid dynamics problems of different tastes, especially with, uh, with having a flavor of nonlinear dynamics. Uh, today, he would be talking about some of these and looking at the chaotic footprints of uh, flapping wings and providing us a computational perspective about this. I would like to uh, 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 welcome Chandan, and I would also like to welcome all the audience who are here. Thank you very much for taking time and joining us for this lecture. I'm looking forward to what Chandan has to say. And uh, Chandan, thank you very much for joining, and the floor is yours. OK, thanks, Ajay, for this nice introduction. Uh, so, and thank you all for attending my talk. Uh, so as uh, Ajay has already introduced me, I am currently a postdoctoral fellow in the Department of Aerospace and Mechanical Engineering in University of Liege. So today I'll be talking about uh, some of the studies that I've done during my PhD in the Applied Mechanics Department of IIT Madras. And I would uh, basically try to give you some glimpse of the amazing flapping flight of the natural flyers and how we can incorporate some of the ideas to uh, the insect-based robotics, uh, which is a very futuristic area. So let's go ahead then. So I currently work in the Fluid Structure Interaction and Experimental Aerodynamics Laboratory, and I work under the guidance of Professor Grigorius Dimitriadis, and I broadly work here on the Fluid Structure Interaction. As you can see, it's a very good windy area of Liege in the town of Liege to study these problems. And we also have a very big wind tunnel in our department where we are conducting different nonlinear aeroelastics and experimental aerodynamic studies. So basically in my project, I'm here to complement some of these experimental studies through high fidelity numerical simulations. And I am, uh, I have done my PhD and master's from IIT Madras, as you already know, and I worked under Professor Sain Gupta in the team of Uncertainty Laboratory and under Professor Sunetra Sarkar in the team of Biomimetics Laboratory in the IITM. And although uh, almost uh, in my whole PhD, I worked in computational areas, but we also had a low speed wind tunnel there where we experimented different flapping wheel, uh, flapping wing. Uh, our in-house made robotics and measured different aerodynamic loads to understand the underlying physics. So let before going into the topic, let, uh, let me introduce uh, to you what I'm currently working on. So the first thing that major area of my research here is fluid structure interaction and developing different fluid structure inter interfaces which can couple uh, different open source fluid solver and solid solvers in a generic manner. So in our department, we in collaboration with uh, Professor Vincent Terapon here in our department, uh, I'm currently working on extending the capabilities of Kupido, which is a Python wrapper and Python based FSI coupler, which basically currently can couple different open source fluid solvers like SU square, or and, and different in-house structural solvers. So I'm currently working to extend this capability towards open foam and so that we can make it more robust to couple different uh, open source solvers which are coming up in the near future so that we can couple any of them like deal two for structure, let's say, and for fluid different lattice Boltzmann solvers like Palabos and there are different very nice open source projects that are coming up. So that uh, is one area that I'm working on. Also, I'm working on the turbulence simulations like uh, LES and different RANS turbulence modeling techniques so that we can actually validate our experimental measurements very accurately and can understand the turbulent flow physics. Also, I uh, have a great interest in different CFD methodologies like immerse boundary methods. So one of my area currently is to investigate the three-dimensional flow structures uh, in the low Reynolds number as well as in the turbulent regime behind different flapping wing flyers. And 
to that end we also work on model order reduction to reduce the computational time to a great extent and we use techniques like pod dmd and relevant cookman based model model order reduction techniques to understand the physics better with a lower computational time and towards the end of my project i will be doing some uh, unsteady aerodynamic and nonlinear aeroelastic experiments in our wind tunnel and you can see these pictures this is a steady stationary configuration of a tandem wing flyer so which later we have planned to make it a fluid structure interaction uh, spring supported model so that we can study the flow physics of a tandem flyer tandem wing flyer like dragonfly let's say so today's talk basically uh, i have divided into three parts so the first part i will just give you an uh, motivation why we should study flapping flight and why it is so amazing and the second part i will be showing you how i used uh, an open source solver open form to you know do such simulations which are very nice and uh, thirdly i would uh, basically present some of the some of my findings that i contributed through my phd thesis and where i showed that this uh, very symmetric and periodic flapping motion can give you a very chaotic flow structure so let's go ahead so just to start my motivation i just want uh, to quote this sentence from which professor david lentin from stanford has talked in his very famous state talk that every feather of a bird is engineered it's actually so true so i will show you some of the examples so where uh, does the motivation come from because this natural flapping flyers they can fly higher farther and longer so to give you some examples there are some uh, species of the birds who which can cross the oceans so basically they don't need even a single break to cross a complete ocean by simply flapping and they they can go very higher and they can actually fly also very longer where they can fly till one year one to two year where they eat they mate even in the sky so this is really amazing isn't it so basically all these are achieved by their propulsion their their the propulsion system that is based on flapping wings so to see that if you see this slow motion video of the flight of a dove or of a pigeon so so basically you can see how uh, elegant the flapping mechanism is so you can see the feathers all the feathers in the wing are basically span wise as well as cord wise flexible and they flap deform and generate the needed aerodynamic load which can basically keep the animal aloft the next example you can see a somersault of a bee so this is really nice isn't it so by different very extreme high angle of attack movement of their flexible flapping wing they can actually take a somersault and still be uh, very stable in the air so it's like they're just playing around so the third example that i want to show it's basically a flight of a geese so basically if you can see how different juggleries or aerodynamic acrobatics they perform just by using their flapping wing so uh, in professor lenting's lab they have you uh, they have taken a very high resolution picture of that which basically shows the actual position of the bird so basically if you see my cursor you can see this bird which is making such acrobatics and if you see the actual picture they can actually fly upside down so these are the capabilities the natural flapping flyers have and the most elegant another example of a flapping flyer is hummingbirds which basically the only i think i'm not sure it's only but it's one of the species of the birds which can stably hover in a symmetric or asymmetrical way and be stable in a single position and 
the most important part of this the flapping frequency is very very high which allows this animal uh, this animal to keep, keep aloft at a single position through hovering so the main question here lies how do birds or insects fly and how are the forces generated during the natural flapping flight of an insect this short and stubby bumblebee doesn't look so flight worthy right and indeed in 1930 the french entomologist august magnan they uh, he made uh, his group made a physics defined statement telling that bumblebee can't fly well but that's not true so we needed some 70 years some decades to understand that the whole question of this how how this little wings generate enough forces to keep the insect in the air is resolved so this is a statement by a uh, renowned uh, professor michael dickinson so so we need we needed so much of time and even then we don't understand all of the things right so that's why we are still researching on it so this flapping uh, flapping flyers uh, in nature are really amazing and there are a lot of things to un still to understand when we'll be able to implement all these mechanisms all these dynamics and all these physics into our man-made devices so let me ask you a question or let me give you a hint towards my talk so this is a very popular myth buster tv show that birds in a truck okay so the myth was that when this truck loaded fully loaded with flapping birds let's say chickens or something so when it crosses the bridge the driver comes out and just make all the uh, flyers all the chickens or birds to fly and he used to think that the load of the truck the total weight will be decreased when the birds are in the in flight condition within the truck so that the truck will be lighter while crossing the bridge so so i am putting this as a question to the audience so do you think it's true or not uh, okay can somebody answer uh, from the audience what do you think no it is not true because when okay. they are flapping the wing they are putting a pressure downward pressure on the uh, floor of the floor. okay anyone else so want to remain same yeah that's right it's right it won't be load will not be less because they are all the the equivalent force whatever they are thing for fight the air pressure will be putting downwards on the truck okay. and the, the yeah, I, I get it. So anybody here want to argue on the opposite way? Anybody is against to it? No, I think so. Yeah, so it's a very popular myth. So everybody believes that the myth is busted and the weight will not be reduced and which is somewhat true. Uh, and there will be no variation. So, so basically whoever has answered can I ask you uh, whether do you mean that there will be no change in the weight of the uh, truck? Theoretically speaking, there will not be any change. But, uh, you know, um, there may be some sort of a, practically, if you see, there may be some sort of a air which will escape from the side, so it will not exert the pressure down below on the floor of the truck. So there may be some minor variations, but by and large, it should remain the same. That's great. That's great. So, so basically, that's true. Mostly, it's true. So, a detailed research. I'm sorry. I went before. Uh, yeah, please. That should also remain the same because if you consider it as a control volume, so you are not allowing anything to escape out of the control volume so net weight will remain the same right okay yeah so let's see what happens so yeah a detailed study has been done and i'll just uh, cite that okay so that's good um yeah so to 
Yeah, to understand this speech is better, basically, uh, just let me uh, tell you that this myth was busted and according to the TV show, also the weight will remain same and as everybody agreed here that there will be no change in the weight within the control volume, which is true. But the flapping flyers, the flight physics, it's not so simple. So to basically to understand more into this physics, I am citing all these examples from uh, Professor David Lenting's lab in Stanford. So where they did this experiment with these parrotlets. And very interestingly, they saw that this flapping, most of these flapping flyers, obviously I will come to the exception. So they generate almost double the body weight only in the downstroke. So you can see, uh, if you see again and again this video with the force plot, you can actually see that when the flyer is performing the downstroke, almost double the body weight of the force aerodynamics force is generated with weight uh, in whereas in the upstroke almost this variation here almost is zero so theoretically speaking for some milliseconds when the bird is basically performing this upstroke the weight of the track should reduce but it's not it's not practical because in an average way the weight doesn't change but however, so there are, so my point was there are more in-depth physics is involved and which is also different during the upstroke as well as in the downstroke of the flapping fly. So it's really interesting. So coming to the point that why the statement that Bumblebee could not fly was physics defined because the analysis of that time when people did, they missed one significant point that all these natural flyers basically exhibit their flight in a very low Reynolds number region where viscosity cannot be neglected. So in this low Reynolds number region, so there is another important event that takes place, which is called dynamic stall. So later in Professor Dickinson's lab, they did experiments with this kind of robotic bees and robotic wings, and they could understand that this dynamic stall, which basically delays the uh, stall or reduction of the lift force, is basically one of the key factor which allows this kind of insects to fly because of the increased lift due to the delayed or dynamic stall. So now, why we are studying all this amazing flapping fly? Because we want to do biomimicry and we want to get inspiration from the nature. And as you can see, we want to build micro air vehicles. So in the right hand side, this is a picture of a, a micro air vehicle that I built as part of my hobby when I was doing PhD and which is inspired by the dragonfly. And there are classical examples of already existing micro air vehicles. Like the first one is from Harvard, then the second one is from Japan, and the third one is most renowned Delphi micro, which is from PU Del. So we want to get inspiration. We want to understand the physics better and better so that we can make this kind of man made flapping devices much elegant and and basically you might know that there are companies like amazon and ola uh so not not ola it's uber i'm sorry so they are basically bringing on projects in us where the current rotor based drone delivery systems will be replaced by the flapping flapping robots in near future so Amazon has this service already. They are working on the project in US and even recently Uber has also started. So why these flapping wing MABs are so, so crucial in the future life? Because of its small size, lightweight, it has hovering capability, it, ha it is power efficient, it can perform indoor flights, it can, it can be very useful in surveillance and environmental monitoring. So let me give you some example. So the first picture is from an urban setting where you know there is not much spacing in the transverse direction. So uh, I mean 
horizontal direction the roads are uh, narrow the second one below you can see a dense forest and the third one top you can see very high altitude and the fourth one is a regions like slate let's say uh, let me give you an example if one building is on fire and there is this narrow urban setting and a very narrow space to enter into the building to get the information about the temperature to get photos or pictures about how many persons are uh, there so can a rotary based drone do this uh, do this kind of jobs i think no so we need to understand how how a natural flyer makes this extreme movements you can see the last uh, bottom corner picture it is so amazing that a natural flyer can even enter through this very small slit by such extreme deformation of their wing and by such extreme maneuvers right so it's actually that's the motivation for studying this kind of system and understanding more and more new insights from them so where did we start so the main research on this flapping flight was started long back so when in 1909 and 1912 noller and betts individually did some theoretical research and they could show that even if a 2d airfoil a oscillating airfoil in the in the vertical direction can generate a effective angle of attack and normal to that direction there is a normal force is generated which can have component in the vertical and the horizontal direction as lift and thrust so this was a groundbreaking you know finding at that point of time because that time people were really interested that okay so by oscillating an airfoil kind of structure also we can generate such kind of vertical and horizontal loads which can be uh, applied to different engineering system and you can see that from from imaginations humans from the time of leonardo da vinci humans are trying to fly so and this theoretical investigation was later validated in 1922 by Kutchmeyer experimentally, which actually gave a lot of confidence to the aerodynamicist that uh, a flapping wing can generate forces and we can really uh, implement it in different engineering systems like CIFAL and different other systems uh, to generate sufficient loads and to perform different engineering jobs so for the bio locomotion system you can see that every flapping animal mostly uh, if you talk of birds or swimming animal if you talk of feces they have some parts of their bodies this marked red here so this is a more generic case not applicable to every every species so which can which can be responsible Birds ka jo hota na, flapping wing wala, they are using on drones. Okay, wa? Sorry. Uh, so nice, uh, it would be nice if you could mute your camera. Chalo, nice. Very good. Hello. Okay, mm -hmm. let me continue. Yeah. Oh, so all these flapping flyers or swimmers, they have a certain part of in their body, body which basically is responsible for generating thirst, as marked in red here. So for our simplification for the study for the understanding the physics better and to start with we can actually under try to understand how the cross section of such wing behaves and the starting point would be to study as rigid flapping foil so if you can see it a uh, rigid two dimensional flapping foil and in combination with two different motions in two degrees of freedom in plunging as a uh, translational, translational movement and pitching as the rotational movement, we can really understand a lot of physics involved in this flapping flight. But with a disclaimer that we, it's simplistic. So we have to go to a complete 3D flexible flapping flyers physics to understand what exactly happens, but it's not bad to start with. So 
this right hand uh, bottom corner picture actually gives you an interesting idea where we are working in terms of the mass and the Reynolds number. So if you can see that this kind of natural flyers like small birds or small insects, they lies within the Reynolds number range of 1000, 100 to 1000 and the mass in terms of kg from 10 to the power minus 6 to 10 to the power minus 4 and maximum to 10 to the power minus 2 if you see look for bats and everything so so basically the whole problem in total is a low Reynolds number problem which gives a lot of physics I mean in terms of flow structures flow fields and which has essential role to play in the generation of the aerodynamic forces so as I showed so if we take a simplistic two dimensional flapping foil, the combination of two different motions can be thought of as a pitching and plunging wing, which is at this point of time is basically rigid and it can basically capture the forced motion, the controlled motion of a wing, right? So in this, uh, in this particular problem, we basically can identify some non-dimensional parameters which, has, which are very crucial to understand the universal physics associated with it. So some of them are, one is Reynolds number obviously, and the second would be Strohal number, which basically is related to the frequency and which is also proportional to this multipliers, which is called non-dimensional plunge velocity, which is nothing but a multiplication of the reduced frequency kappa and the non-dimensional stroke amplitude h okay i'm mentioning this because most of my later part of the results will be based on these parameters okay so now to understand how the load is generated the trailing edge wake pattern is also very very much essential to understand because they are uh, in turn responsible for generating the nature of the aerodynamic loads so if you can see this KH parameter, as I mentioned, is very important. If we simply vary them for a particular Reynolds number, particular Reynolds number within this region, which is below 1000, we can actually see based on different values of the reduced frequency of the wing, nice, interesting wake patterns, which is starting from, let's say, when KH is almost zero, the foil is stationary, we'll get a von Kerman wake. And starting from that, we can reach to a deflected wake pattern, which is basically called a uh, symmetry waking bifurcation happens of the reverse common wake pattern, which is at D. As we keep on increasing this non-dimensional plunge velocity or the Strohal number. So these are some of the experimental pictures, which basically shows us different interesting patterns. And not only that, if we change the kinematics, let's say instead of two degree of freedom, we do only a plunging or a single degree of translational wing or a rotational wing, the, these patterns changes, okay? So where does it go to the actual real life thing? So you the you, you know the flapping motion of, uh, of the wing of the flap, natural flapping flyer are completely controlled by them. So as according to the need, according to the need of their movement or whatever they want, they can actually change their kinematics, change their angle of attack, change their deformation of the wing. So, so to understand that for different kinematics, what happens and what kind of flow structures are generated in this low Reynolds, low Reynolds number is very important. So you can see by these two experimental works, which are done by soft film experiments, that there are variety of wake patterns that can be generated in the wake of a flapping wing. Also, there are, as I said, there is another important event that can occur is the loss of symmetry of the wake. So previously you have seen that the von Kerman wake or the reverse von Kerman wake are symmetric, right? So in that symmetric manner, there will be no lift. So the lift will be generated, finite amount of lift will be generated when the symmetry breaking bifurcation happens of the wake and the wake becomes a deflect, deflected wake. So this is called the deflection phenomena or the symmetry breaking bifurcation of the wake. 
And more interestingly, if you increase the Strohal number or kinematics and few different parameters, you can see this deflected wave can spontaneously change its direction from down to up or up to down and vice versa and so on. So basically this phenomena is very interesting, which I looked at and it is called jet switching phenomena. So which also has an important role in the load generation. And coming to the last part of this category. So till now, whatever we were talking of, so you can intuitively expect that if you are symmetrically moving a, a period, uh, uh, an airfoil with a periodic motion, you are expected to get a periodic wake pattern and with different patterns that I showed. But it is more interesting that this periodicity can be lost through different bifurcation phenomena in terms of dynamical system theories and can give you a completely unpredictable load, which is a matter of concern, right? So if you build a flapping device and you give some kind of control amplitude and frequency where the load aerodynamic load generated is unpredictable. So you don't know at next time step, what kind of load will be generated, which will drastically reduce the efficiency of propulsion. So this is an important and interesting region of work, which I looked at in my PhD. So these are the experimental frames from Professor Lenting's lab where they, they showed that in the uh, in the basically they basically showed the phase Everest images where the blurred regions mean that at every time period your flow patterns are different. So they are completely unpredictable. So if you average them out, it will be completely blurred, which denotes that the dynamics is aperiodic. But till that point of time, it was not linked to actual the dynamical system theories and what kind of dynamical transitions are happening in those flow fields were not known. So basically, I, I, I feel happy that our group first established that part and linked it rigorously with the dynamical systems theories and proved that 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 is nothing but a dynamical chaos, which takes place in a deterministic system and at a very high value of uh, this plunge, the dynamic plunge velocity. And for this study is for a plunge, plunging wing with a single degree of freedom. And this kind of phenomena is seen at KH value as high as 2.4. Okay, so as I basically open up this problem, I think I have taken a lot of time here. So some of the open things that are still in the that, that are still as open questions in the literature that is one is this aperiodic wake topology it's not given you know much interest which is which i looked at and basically the effect of kin kinematics and different uh, relationship between the near field and far field wake and the effect of three-dimensionality effect of you know span wise and cord wise flexibility and most mostly last but not the least the effect of flow fluctuations so these are some of the areas that i looked on so here my first part ends and this part is basically for the students out there so as ajay requested me to give a give an overview of how i simulated this kind of problem so i basically used open form, which is, which is available as open source and a very rich library of fluid dynamic codes. And it's a very uh, big competitor in the other, uh, a competitor to the other open source codes like SU square. So all the different uh, algorithms written here, written here are based on finite volume method and C++ language and why we come to open form i why we chose open form because it's open source and it has high level of programming and the most important point is we can tailor our solver so i i'm a fan of open source engineering so i don't believe in reinventing the wheel right so if we have already 
somebody has spent their 10 years 15 years in uh, you know in putting up a open source code you should use it and made it made progress to the further level of uh, capability so you should not you know write you know the same thing again for next 15 years so there open form helps a lot it gives you all the source codes where you can modify the codes as per your need you can incorporate your own solver which i did so i took the navier stroke solver uh, a generic navier stroke solver from open form repository and i modified it and included the spanwise flexibility module into it so that really helped me you know understanding the a fluid structure interaction relevant to the flapping fly and it has as i said extensive multiplegics capability and it's basically a cross platform coupling nowadays there are a lot of new coupling uh, platforms are coming like i told one is that we are developing a scoopido there is already available precise which can couple open form with any open source you know finite element or finite volume structural codes like deal to calculate and there are a lot i think uh, some of my friends who are present here are working on that and uh, so it's it's actually amazing that you have a separate fluid solver code which is open source and you can make modification on the fluid side as well as you have an open source code in the structural side where you can also make modifications and you have a wrapper which can couple them both and give you the accurate results for fluid structure interaction so this is really nice and i'm looking forward to working with such tools more and more as it's coming and so this is just a beginning level introduction that what do you mean by high level programming in open form there open form has its namespace and of classes and objects which can which is already written so you don't have to do anything so you can see in this example how easily we can uh, convert a navier stokes equation into a small bracket of code so basically we just have to choose the namespace of the classes and we just have to choose the relevant uh, make a relevant cfd schemes which is very easy and it can be learned very easily in my opinion so the other way is what is the comparison like why we can prefer open form or uh, any other open source codes because you don't have to pay for license uh, open form is very much scalable in the parallel world so it in the parallel computing wise you can scale open form to a great extent you have all the source code as i said you can make a collaborative development you can work with one uh, of your collaborator who is expert in the structural field and you are good at fluid field so you can collaborate and develop in the both sides and make a great fsi solver and what is basically not there is basically open form is not i always say to everyone that it's no black magic so you can just click buttons and get results in open form it doesn't have a single executable so you need to understand the source code which is good in my opinion you don't do such black magic and there is no native gui which is a major you know lackings but i think in the coming years uh, there are i would not i would say there is, it's false that there is no native gui there are some again open source projects separately who has developed gui but it's not native and it's not so popular and again not well documented i said this when i started work in 2014 but it is much better now so at every year they are developing the open form governments are developing the documentation and which is much better now and this is a small history of open form starting from 1989 and the main contributors were uh, professor henry weller and professor jessup and till now okay so this is outdated i would say in 2020 open form version 8 of the open form foundation has been released and yeah this is updated here so basically you have to understand that open form has three forks one is open form foundation release which is the current version is version 8 and other is the open form esi open form version which is the cur the current version of which is version 2006 and this uh, updates normally comes once in a year or 
the ESI version comes once in six months, and there is there are another extended version of it which is very useful for some of the capabilities which i use is home extend and the current version is home extend 4.1 so basically again our introductory slide so basically in open form you have three different parts one is pre-processing so i would just say that block mesh is the native pre-processing and meshing tool in open form and snappy hex mesh is there which is slightly uh, involved, but it is a great tool for complex geometry. Other than that, I would suggest using GMSH, CFMESH, Salome for the pre-processing. And as a solver, according to your problem of interest, you can choose any of the solver in this broad categories. And for post-processing, I think Paraview is sufficient, but you have Salome, you have GNU plot, you have take plot, you have visit, there are a lot of tools to do your post-processing. Okay, that's all about the introduction. And quickly, I will tell you what I used for simulating this kind of problems. So basically, I used the ALE approach for my PhD, which is arbitrary Lagrangian Eulerian approach, where basically you cast the Navier-Stokes equation in the ALE form with modify by modifying the convecting velocity with the mesh grid velocity um and uh, yeah please stop me if you have any questions you don't have to wait for the end of the meeting and i as i said open form is a finite volume based cfd solver and my spatial and temporal discretizations were second order accurate and I used a very adaptive time stepping based on maximal current number and I use PISO algorithm for solving the pressure poison equation and I set the criteria to be convergence criteria spatial and temporal to be 10 to the power minus 6. Okay, so this is an interesting part. I think I thought that I should point out this is a mesh motion strategy. So basically, whenever you use such kind of algorithm like ALE approach where your mesh has to be changed at every time step, either you have to remesh it, otherwise you have to deform the mesh. So based on your need and your need of resolution of the results you can choose, there are different dynamic mesh motion uh, uh, mesh motion strategies available in open form. One of this is radial basis interpolation. So I have chosen this for a very high resolution of my results, but disclaimer is that it is computationally very costly. So here based on the body movement or basically displacement values of the in the boundaries of the body, you can deform the whole mesh at every time step based on this function, which is called the radius radial basis interpolation function and this phi x is a basis function which can be take which can be chosen so i have chosen here inverse quadratic uh, multi harmonic function so you can calculate the deformed position of the mesh at every time step and you can deform the mesh accordingly so this is a picture of you know how the mesh deforms here so this is a, an optimized technique which between the Lagrangian and Eulerian uh, techniques, because this can this method of dynamic mesh strategy can capture very high deformation problems, which is proved. And you can get the details in this paper by Boss from TUDEL. And I ran all my simulation in a highly parallel environment, and I used uh, the supercomputer Virgo, which was available in IIT Madras. And by using simple domain decomposition techniques, which is inbuilt in open form, you can scale your simulations to cores as high as uh, you know 64 or 120, depending on the wall time of the distribution facility. So it is very easy to even go for very intensive problems. And there are different domain decomposition techniques that you can choose in open form. So this is a, a comparison, how you can distribute the whole domain. So first one is simple, where you can divide your whole mess into a rectangular, in a rectangular fashion uh, by simply the method, which is called simple. Whereas you can optimize your uh, 
your basically interface between different regions which are distributed into different processors and uh, you can basically drastically reduce the interaction time through uh, dif uh, there are different uh, methods available one of this is metis other was scotch and there are other methods available which are called hierarchy where you can tailor or customize these divisions yourself so this is how the mesh looks so we divide the whole domain into different processes and the computations are done differently and once the computations are completed we reconstruct the whole field to get the field variables and this is just to give a small idea about how it scales but it is done for a very low number of processes up to 16 but the main takeaway point from this slide is i have compared two different dynamics so one is periodic another is chaotic okay so so you can see the speed up ratio is so higher for periodic whereas for chaotic it is lesser so when you're so basically this is very intuitive because when your dynamics gets uh, chaotic you can come back to this deformation this deformation of the mesh becomes so vigorous that it takes more and more time so these chaotic simulations are very much time consuming and even with parallel computation it took weeks for me to generate these results because I went for a very high resolution data, which I'll be presenting in a while. And OpenFOAM has all capabilities to check your results online. So basically, when you are running the code, you can check the residuals of the solution on screen. And if you think residuals are growing up, you can just stop the code and check what, where, it go, where, where it went wrong. So, so basically, this is very much modular, right? So you can actually online check the accuracy you can check how much your current number is varying and you can also save all these things in log file for later investigation but i would suggest that this online uh, investigation or online monitoring of the residues helped me a lot because most of the time i when i was setting up the case something would have went wrong and this saved a lot of time well, so I used a circular domain with 25 quad radius of the airfoil and you can see the fineness of my mesh. It had almost uh, five to six lakh cells and with fully unstructured grids I have used. Uh, and yeah, my solver, I, I won't spend much time here because my solver is, I have so, this is just to give an idea whenever you are trying to convince someone with your computational results you have to you know convince them with your grid independence qualitative validation with experimental results so the left hand side is my results and right one side is experimental results and this is for different kinematics and also quanti in quantitative way you have to so match with different experimental results for different kinematics as well so once that is done, you are ready to, you know, go and explore your area of work or area of interest. So this part uh, of the study, I will present some of my results and so how a flapping flight can be unpredictable. So I will take a moment and ask Ajay how much time I have. Uh, hey, uh, hey, Chandan, sorry. I think uh, we have another five to 10 minutes maybe and then we can probably take some questions i think there are already quite some interesting questions maybe but i think it would be nice uh, to look through the results and then we can come back to it i guess if that's okay for yeah me. sure 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 so basically i'll just give an overview of the results of my phd findings so here in the initial stage we looked at the near field so what do we mean by near field the near field we mean by I defined it, so it's user defined. So I defined it to be, let's say, three chord around the airfoil where the main interaction of the vortices takes place and beyond which the vortex structures are not affecting the load generation so much, right? So it depends on the distance from the body. So initially, we looked at the dynamical transition that takes place in the near field. So interestingly, for this pitching plunging kinematics of the foil, 
we saw that as we increase the non-dimensional stroke amplitude in turn the dynamic crunch velocity or the strohal number we saw that the chaotic transition is happening through a quasi periodic loop what do we mean by that so if you see this velocity profiles at a low value of h you can see it is nicely a reverse kerman wake which gives a very periodic for the five cycles that i have compared very periodic and repeatable nature of the velocity profile and we have also calculated the correlation of the vorticity field uh, in a rectangular region near to the trailing edge of the foil where you saw that it goes to the value of 1 which means that the flow field is perfectly correlated so as you increased the strohal number or the non dimensional plunge velocity you can see that correlation value decreases and in when you compare the velocity profiles you also see that the velocity profiles are not exactly repeating each other in the consecutive cycles which means that they are in the neighborhood but they are not exactly repeating so this kind of dynamics which we will prove uh, through dynamical system theory this later is called the quasi periodic dynamics which is a local bifurcation route towards chaos in the dynamical systems theory and as we increase the age value you can see the correlation of os value oscillates around zero and giving a completely chaotic nature of the flow field and the velocity profiles are also no more uh, repeating with in the consecutive cycles and you can see it's completely unpredictable which means that the aerodynamic loads generated are also unpredictable which is the interesting thing so here some of the time series analysis result uh, in terms of time series and phase reconstructed phase space wavelet analysis and uh, through this time series analysis we have seen that so initially which was a quasi periodic transition in the near field when we studied with more higher resolution we saw that this region is also accompanied by another interesting phenomena which is called intermittency so intermittency is defined by the change in the qualitative dynamics of the system with the change in the control parameter so basically you can see an interplay of two different dynamics in the same system as you go along with time so so in the time history here at 8.8 equal to 0.83 you can see that we can see some sporadic windows of aperiodicity within the periodic regime within the periodic burst okay so this dynamics is called intermittent and which this sporadic aperiodic bursts are accompanied by a broadband frequency spectra in the time frequency scale in the wavelet transforms so what happens in the flow field if you look at the bottom right hand corner you can see that initially there is a downward couple which was forming at the at the trailing edge got completely lost the structure got completely lost in the next t by capital 35 cycle and again at t by capital t equal to 36 in the next cycle the flow regains its periodicity but the direction of the vortex couple gets reversed in the upward direction so as you remember in the literature we tell this phenomena as a jet switching so the next finding uh, was important that i am coming but this is some uh, other time series analysis result through which we conclusively proved that it is really a dynamical chaos and not randomness because we are doing all analysis in a deterministic manner and with symmetric air foil and periodic kinematics so there is no uncertainty other than the numerical noise but we have proved it conclusively with different robust mosers that this transition is physical well so so as i was saying here that so this intermittency phenomena was related to the jet switching phenomena which is also an interesting spatial phenomena that occurs in the transition of the wave well so next i actually investigated the mechanisms of different this different kind of transitional dynamical states so the first one is quite intuitive and predictable that how a reverse kerman vortex strip generates so the mechanism was found to be a partial merging where a p plus a structure initially formed at the trailing edge of the wing merges and 
undergoes a partial merging, which is a term from vortex dynamics, vortex dynamics per view, and ultimately forms a reverse Kármán vortex state, as you can see. But the interesting thing was how come the quasi-periodic trigger came into the flow field? Because everything was deterministic. So that was an interesting investigation. For that, we went into depth and we showed that that this the trigger of the quasi-periodic uh, transition was an additional frequency which was incommensurate to the dominant flapping frequency, which is F1 here. And this F1 was related to the leading edge vortex setting. So the trigger of this aperiodicity came from the leading edge vortex. So there was some perturbation that came into the leading edge vortex, which propagated downstream and made the whole flow field quasi-periodic in the initial stage. So that was an interesting find that a slight perturbation in uh, leading edge vortex generation and its growth can change the complete dynamics of the system. And we rigorously proved the perturbation by plotting the vortex course of the leading edge. And we can see that from this one simple example that the leading edge vortex, the primary leading edge vortex that forms basically does not repeat itself in next consecutive cycles, whereas it stays in the neighborhood and which basically propagates in the downstream. And when it interacts with the trailing edge vortex, you know, creates the propagates the perturbation and creates a quasi periodic interaction. And by this uh, tracking of the vortex core, we have shown how a vortex core slightly shifts from its previous position in the consecutive time steps and ultimately comes back to the neighborhood of its initial position. However, it doesn't repeat exactly, which is the key nature of the quasi periodic dynamics. And these are the subsequent interaction, how the wake completely becomes, uh, completely loses its periodicity. So that is through, again, the partial merging of this three structure and the couple C4, which is basically all our simultaneous results of the final leading edge vortex propagation. Now, what happens in the next stage, as I told that when the intermittency appears in the system, then we see two different uh, phenomena of jet switching. So the first one at the top is called basically the far end switching, where the vortex couple switches in the far end of the wake, but the, in the near end, the direction of the uh, primary vortex couple here stays the same as of the periodic system. So you can see a very nicely organized secondary vortex state completely disorganizes and gives the trigger for this far end switching. Whereas if we go towards a higher uh, stroke amplitude where the intermittent intermittent sporadic aper aperiodic windows becomes more and more frequent, the prevalence of chaos becomes more prominent and finally it allows to change the direction of the deflection of basically the primary trailing edge vortex couple. So you can clearly see that the direct downward directional uh, trailing edge vortex couple completely changes its direction to the upward and changing the whole direction of the vortex street in the deflection condition. So this upward to downward transition through an intermittent aperiodic window was a very interesting find of my study, which basically gave us insight about the mechanism of the jet switching phenomena in a dynamical sense that we could say that intermittency was responsible for this complete switching of the wave. And the second phenomena that we saw that this switching from downward to upward motion was completely random and there was no such period that after such period it will happen. So it was, I would say it's not random, it's aperiodic because there is no randomness in the system. And through these animations, you can actually see how a downward couple could go through an aperiodic window of intermittency and finally a upward deflected 
vortex street was generated so this was very nice by the way these animations are basically showing the FTLE contours, which is finite Lyapunov exponent uh, contours, which shows and which basically captures the vortex boundaries very well. And in dynamical sense, they represent the manifolds of the flow, spatial flow patterns. And I am showing the backward FTLE contours, which is integrated backward and which actually gives uh, you the unstable manifolds of the system and in turn it captures the vortex boundaries. So I will answer any question if you have later. Okay, so finally, when we reach to chaos, what are the mechanism? So what is the trigger? So as per the quasi-periodic dynamics, similarly, we get the same trigger from the leading edge. And if, if you can see in three consecutive cycles, the behavior of the leading edge gets completely changed. So this is completely unpredictable, which leads to a complete unpredictable flow field. So this animation shows you how nice interactions happens in the chaotic region and what are the fundamental interaction that governs the chaos and that persists the chaos. So as we can see that the trigger was from leading edge, but then we were interested to look at what were the fundamental vortex interaction mechanism that sustained the chaos throughout the time right so that was uh, we found that in 2d those were the basic 2d vortex interaction mechanism like complete margin as you see in the bottom left hand corner and also the spontaneous formations of vortex couples and their interactions their various types of interactions collisions exchange of partner which were uh, basically uh, found to be the dominant interaction in 2d turbulence actually sewed up during the chaotic region. So this identifications of the basic mechanisms of chaos in the flow field of a flapping wing was really interesting. Okay, so, and later on, I faced a lot of questions from my reviewers when I tried to publish this, that this was an 2D artifact. This cannot happen in 3D and so on so there these were the questions so initially when we proved in the literature that the uh, the chaos can actually exist in a deterministic symmetrically flapping uh, wing flow field we faced a lot of problems so but we actually proved it that it is not 2d artifact and it can actually happen in 3d as well however there are some takeaway points to that so just to mention for the 3d simulations I used the immersed boundary method framework, which is, which gives me a lot of uh, privilege in terms of numerical cost, and it can handle any different uh, difficult complex geometries that we try to simulate, which is not the case in case of uh, ALE approach, because of the uh, higher skewness of the mesas, your solution diverges. So I used the immersed boundary uh, capability of open foam to simulate this 3d structures and similar to 2d we also categorized the drag producing and thrust producing wake patterns in case of a flapping foil and we saw that for a 3d structure the stable wake pattern is a bifurcated wake pattern so as you can see that it is a bifurcated wake with vortex rings towards the normal vector either in inside or the outside for drag producing and the thrust producing cases. So it is also interesting that in 3D, the vortex structures are completely different than 2D because we are just seeing a cross section. So basically, if you take a cross section of this bifurcated way, you will see only vortex couples for each vortex rings. So basically, the vortex rings in 2D represents a vortex couple. However, the takeaway take point is that the 3D wakes are very much stable, okay? So then the question comes, so where it will transition to chaos or not? The answer is yes. However, the onset boundaries to these different bifurcations will change. So for example, here at k h equal to 2, in 2D we saw chaos, but there is no chaos here. So that is the most probable reason that in the literature people actually told that there are no chaos in 3D. However, we saw that there 
is the presence of chaos, but at very high k h value. So you can see this. Uh, you can basically you can compare this basic stable structure of the three D with this, and how the stable structure completely breaks down and gives you a chaotic structure. So the main conclusion that we made, and this is yet to be published, is that in 3D, the bifurcation scenario and the trigger for this bifurcation remains the same. Although the vortex structure, a vortex couple becomes a vortex ring, a vortex uh, trailing edge shear layer becomes a vortex filament in 3D. However, the trigger comes from the leading edge vortex ring. And with time, this breaks down and gives this chaotic structure. So essentially, the mechanism remains same. Only the boundaries of this on bifurcation onset changes. Okay, so I think I will keep my uh, talk here. I will stop my talk here because the next part is where I studied the flexibility, the effect of flexibility. I think that will take a lot of time, which may not serve the audience purpose. Is it okay, Ajay? Hello. Yeah, yeah, sure. So maybe we can start out with questions, and yeah, yes. and I think we can probably go into more details. Sorry about that. I, I have a question. So how how is the transition to chaos is different from transition to transition to say, turbulence? Yes, uh, exactly. So that is a very good question. So I would say that the you know, textbook definition of turbulence and my belief that turbulence is a higher order chaos. Okay, so so turbulence is nothing but a higher order chaos. And there are existing debates about that whether turbulence is random or deterministic. And I believe that it is deterministic and it's a higher order chaos and it has been proved through different its fractal nature self similarity and different Lyapunov of exponents but however i do not call it transition to turbulence here because my reynolds number is very low so so all these studies are done in at a reynolds number of thousand uh which but, you know yeah but please. for the 3d cases you are uh, seeing basically smaller scales Exactly, so, exactly. So, so, but again, the there the for the 3D cases, the Reynolds number is still lower. So, I have done the 3D simulation at r equal to 500, and uh, yeah, so that that is a you know open question whether we can call this chaos as turbulence. But in the low Reynolds number literature, uh, according to the community, quote unquote, our flapping community, we do not call it turbulence, and instead we call it chaos. But again, I believe that turbulence is a higher order chaos. Okay. So, uh, just yeah. another question. So you have uh, in one of the slides you have uh, shown that you have uh, taken basically omega h is equal to omega a, right? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, so have you ever tried for the different values of an omega h yes. is not equal to omega? A? Exactly. Uh, yes, we are trying, but that case is not part of my PhD, and I'm not presented uh -huh. here. So. Our team uh, with my juniors and all, I am still trying with. So some of my juniors are now trying in our lab, in my PhD lab, about transitionary flight. So where, uh, you know, the frequency of the flapping can also change with time. So so that is one, uh, one another expect. And there is a recent PRE paper that came out, which says that if, you're, if you uh, modulate your frequency by some kind of uh, time you, you, uh, with some kind of time evolution you can see such kind of transition to jet switching and it can even lead to chaos for in intermittent times like whenever your uh, kh or strohal number is higher it can behave per periodically and it can come back right so so those kind of studies are being done and uh, the other thing that i should mention that uh, this study that i presented is with a phase difference zero where there is no phase difference between pitching and plunging however we are currently doing such study and which shows uh, remarkable different things so basically uh, if you change the phase difference between this pitching and plunging kinematics you can actually see that your bifurcation onset can also change so even at a high a lower cage value if you 
give an appropriate phase, uh, you, you can it can lead to a chaotic dynamics. So that is another aspect that we are currently studying. Okay. Uh, uh, I think there were a couple of questions I, we, uh, that was uh, typed out. Uh, maybe we can also take these uh, things uh, just sure. in case. I think sure. Professor Titikanta from IIT Delhi had a couple of questions. I think, uh, uh, particularly, kind of, I mean, let's say, let's start with a simple question that he asked like, could you explain a bit about hummingbird hover, uh, a bit in a simple term? What makes them okay. capable of hovering? I think this is a very interesting question that uh, a lot of people would have, I guess, right? I mean, okay, okay. So I, I don't have a schematic to show, it would have been great, but yeah so but uh, let me see just give me a minute if i get a schematic for that but just uh, okay start uh, let me start explaining so uh, the hovering kinematics is nothing but a combination of this pitching and plunging kinematics okay so instead of the case that i have shown is basically has a it's just it's symmetric so it pitches and plunges with respect to the horizontal axis in case of hovering what happens is the wings move in an inclined stroke plane so in uh, i mean additionally there is a stroke plane angle which is normally denoted by beta which defines the stroke plane of the hovering wing section and the other important feature that hovering has and which makes it you know symmetric or asymmetric that is based on the turning acceleration so basically when a wing is an inclined stroke plane and it goes in an in inclined stroke plane according to the figure eight cycle of the flapping motion which is particular to each of the species and then when it changes its face completely and comes back from the upstroke to downstroke they are the important feature that the turning angle or the acceleration which plays a lot of role in recovering the lift while coming back to the downward uh, stroke so these are the uh, some special features that a hovering insect has and which uh, you know capables them hovering so i think is it clear i mean in a loose term uh, i have two questions uh, like uh, can i go ahead yeah please go ahead go ahead uh, so one is like uh, you spoke about this uh, uh, route to transition to chaos via intermittency so yes. and you also mentioned about this uh, quasi periodicity route also like yes. uh, we, we know that in quasi periodic uh, route to, to chaos we have we experience each hop bifurcations so what exactly. act, what actually happens in this route to chaos in intermittency like what sort of bifurcation do we experience yeah okay so yeah i will go this is a very good question and in depth question so probably uh, uh, am I allowed to go ahead with the flexible part so that I can answer his question? Yeah, I, think I, think that's, I think that's good. Okay. So I will show you. So, okay. Okay. So, yeah. So the first answer to that question is you are right in the dynamical system literature uh, quasi periodicity or quasi periodic transition takes place when a secondary hop bifurcation or which is also called neymar secker bifurcation takes place from the after the primary hop bifurcation right but yes. you have to imagine that we are characterizing these dynamical systems for the rigid case that i presented based on a forcing kinematics so it's not coupled or there is no feedback from the structure to flow or flow to structure for the previous case. So the wing was forced. However, we have a nonlinear flow. So we are solving the flow by Navier-Stokes equation. So in the flow dynamics, the similar stability analysis could be done either by flow case stability or by dynamic mode decomposition. You can actually characterize what are the stable modes and what are the unstable modes and which is basically responsible for that so i would say that it's a very difficult question for the rigid uh, flapping wing to answer what kind of bifurcation happens during intermittency so i cannot say that it is a saddle node bifurcation which gives you a bottleneck and you see a intermittency so that's not a that's not possible because that's a forcing case but 
when we deal with a flexible wing so in this model particularly i incorporate the span wise flexibility in terms of two degree of freedom so if you if you can imagine a 3d wing that has uh, simplistically that has two modes which is translational and rotational so catering to the bending and torsional modes we can model it in 3d by uh, 2d by by two uh, one translational spring and a rotational spring so in this case the flow and structure is coupled right so in this kind of fsi uh, fsi scenario also i see such kind of similar bifurcation since the kinematics is pitch plant here i would answer your question so in this case you can see that initially from the there in the absence of this case is done in the absence of a control forcing so there is no forcing so the wing is freely vibrating based on the flow unsteady flow and vortex interaction so beyond the stationary response which is damped beyond 1.1 you can see the first hop bifurcation takes place which gives a self oscillatory dynamics which is called limit cycle oscillation and then beyond 1.8 u star equal to beyond 1.8 you can see the dynamics becomes quasi periodic which gives you the onset of the secondary hop or the neymar secker bifurcation right so just to you know go fast so here basically in the frequency ratio plot you can see that how the uh, relation between these two incommensurate frequency changes and there i saw an another important aspect that beyond uh, so basically before 1.1 u star equal to 1.1 you can see the hop bifurcation happens and in between after the quasi periodic response there is a region of frequency locking okay so which is interesting because beyond which it shows a three frequency quasi periodic response and the root that uh, we basically denote is a ruelle tekens neuau scenario so we did not see any kind of intermittency there but so am i clear so for a fsi system we can actually characterize such uh, specific bifurcations which occurs to give you lco or quasi periodic city or intermittency but for the forced case the intermittency happens that is true because dynamically intermittency is basically interplay of two different dynamics which can be between chaos and periodicity chaos and quasi periodicity and so on but it is very difficult to clearly point out actually what kind of bifurcation like either saddle node or something else is happening to give way to the intermittent scenario <coughs> is it clear okay hello so basically i mean i really don't know in a force we, system yeah, what yeah, exactly actually, the spirit of the uh, yeah. mm -hmm. sorry okay Okay. Fine. So, uh, this is just another question on the numerics part of things. Okay. I, I saw that you had used the IBM or inverse boundary method. In uh, was this also in open form? Is this like some inverse form or something? What's being used there? Yes, yes. I have used the IBM capability of open form. Okay. And uh, what about this? Uh, you said that uh, you ex uh, explored, explored a couple of uh, domain decomposition techniques, right? Yeah, uh, one of them was I think simple, and the other was Matus. You also said that there's hierarchical and uh, uh, I think Scotch. 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 Yeah. Scotch, right? And how how does the load balancing work with these things? Is there any kind of load balancing that goes? Yeah, into yeah, uh, uh, yeah. But uh, actually, I'm not an expert in that field because you know all this MPI interface is inbuilt in open form, and okay. the load leveler, the that the load leveler. So either you you slam or some other load leveler so that is very specific to your supercomputing system right so right. so basically for virgo in iit madras we had something called load leveler uh, so ll which which actually did it automatically so i am uh, practically i don't have much in detail knowledge about load balancing uh, mm -hmm. but like in belgium i use slam which has which gives you more detailed information and how you can balance the load 
Okay, I see. Interesting. Because at the end of the day, it's like load balancing becomes a very critical thing, right? That's exactly. I remember that. Uh, that's true. Saying that it took several weeks to run the. Uh, yeah, that's true. Right? That's true. So this that's was in two D, uh, or this was this in three D. The IBM case was in three D. Okay, but the other one was in two D. I see. I see. Yes, okay. other one was two D. Okay. And uh, there's a couple of other questions from uh, Dr. Siti Kanta from IIT Delhi, Professor, Professor Siti Kanta. Uh, mm -hmm. So he asked, like, in the lower Reynolds number region, can we mm -hmm. do a one-way coupled uh, fluid structure interaction? Or I mean, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. fluid forces can be considered external forces on the structural problem? Uh, yeah. So, so as a fluid structure interaction researcher, I personally don't believe there is something called one-way fluid structure interaction. So, which is one way that is, I believe that, that is not fluid structure interaction at all. Okay. So, fluid structure interaction means there would be a feedback from fluid and the structure vice versa. But there are many studies are done uh, where the lack of resource is there. So, basically what they do is they, or or some other kind of scenario can be done. Like I think uh, Professor S Sachin Sinde is here. So he is an experimentalist. So we were thinking of some project. Let's say we do uh, we do experiments on flexible foils and where we have, let's say, vibrating profiles. OK, so we have complete deformation profile of the flapping wing. But if we uh, want more physics in terms of simulation, we give we can give those profiles uh, into our CFD simulation at every time step and we can study the flow physics. So that is kind of one example of one way interaction. But again, that is not, I would say that is not, uh, you know, two way interaction. So, in my opinion, FSI is inherently two way. Okay. So, but but that doesn't depend on low Reynolds number. So, the Reynolds number regime depends on your application. So, right. I, will, I will give you an example. So, my PhD, my whole study was in low Reynolds number. But in my uh, postdoc here, we are doing experiments with aircraft wing and some nonlinear aeroelasticity experiments in a big wind tunnel that I showed the picture of, which can take uh, care of uh, velocity up to 60 meters per second in the subsonic region. So if I want to validate those experiments, my low Reynolds number simulations will never match. Mm -hmm. So because of that, we are now working in the turbulent region uh, with some kind of transitionary boundary model or LES simulations. I, mean, I have uh, a second question. Uh, can I go, can I ask? Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah. So the second question actually is a little bit philosophical in nature. See, uh, you have studied the uh, the response of the chaotic response of the plunging wing, but uh, yes. bird structure or the insect wings are basically active structures. So they exactly. so they would receive exactly. feedbacks. And based yes. on which actually they will change the patterns. Now, so yes, is it possible exactly. that they they will ever experience chaos this way? Like if no, no, case, that's a very good question. And I should have mentioned I got your question. Sorry for interrupting. So that is a ba very basic question. I, I should have mentioned it because that is the concluding thing. So why we are studying chaos? So that's the basic question. I mean, because we never see any flying animal or flying bird or insects, they do, I mean they undergo chaos so you can see that that we are getting chaos at a very high strohal number region so if you see the swimmers natural swimmers or natural birds probably the strohal number range is much lower okay that is one answer why they do not undergo chaos second thing why we are studying the philosophical part we are studying it because if we want to design a man-made flapping device, in that case, we really don't want to know, right, what kind of control frequency and amplitude we should give so that you it behaves stable. True, true. So this, but in that case also, we have the actuators uh, like placed in the wing structures, which actually will try to uh, like outdo any kind of uncertain forces acting on it. So generally, when we if you are designing a flapping wing structures, we will have yes. actuators. So that actuators actually will take care of like any certain aperiodic behaviors or sudden gust of wind acts on the structures for a short exactly. while. Exactly. So, so you are talking of morphing kind of structure, right? Uh, uh, yeah, some sort of a con control mechanisms, so like which will take care of it to outdo. The okay, fine. And yeah. Yeah. So, so, like so basically, uh, the the philosophical aim of this study 
one in one side is to give you know benefit those control designs so so if you put a controller you need to design the algorithm right how you want to uh, operate it like how the actuator should behave it should based on a control algorithm so that should have a input yes, frequency yes. and amplitude range for the stable operation region so that is one part and the last part which is purely academic is i am fascinated about this chaotic transition and this flow flow structures how it get transition from the periodic to chaos so that is the purely academic motive of that but again it it has applications to give you know input to the control design algorithm which can stably take care of that so that's why the fsi case i that i showed we did the study in the absence of a control forcing so that we can understand when there is no control forcing how the wing behaves and then accordingly we can put some control amplitude and frequency to see how we can control the chaos right so that is kind of motive to it so so another uh, example to your question i would say that currently we are doing a study of a flexible filament kind of structure in the wake of a blub body so mainly for the energy harvesting purpose so there you can see that for if you change the shape of the blub body your wake in the lorenol number gets chaotic and which makes the response of the flexible flapper very much unpredictable but if we change the offset distance from the you know major axis or minor axis of the blub body towards transverse direction we can organize the wake so basically this kind of relative position also can organize it so unless you understand which position is optimum for that particular case it is difficult so before we go towards controlling we need to understand what is happening what kind of transition is happening in the absence of control so that was the motive when we did this study is it somewhat clear hello okay uh, so maybe we can take the next question and then we can come back uh, so in terms of like a spatial simulation time discretization and space discretization that you are doing using the various algorithms uh, how is it uh, how is the sensitivity towards numerical stability i mean in terms of convergence issues uh yeah so it is pretty good in open form solvers are quite well validated before they keep into the repository so that's the solver that i used uh it's uh, i mean you are talking about uh, the transients like like right. after right. after how much time you get converged results so i preferably take 10 to 15 cycles out of my consideration just to remove all those uncertain cases so after no. 15 cycle for uh, i think it gives the accurate physics no i i mean if i if i'm right there's yes, open form has a lot of these kind of uh, uh, what they call as solvers right interform piezo form simple yeah yeah form. yeah exactly exactly uh, so i used uh, something called icodim form okay. which uh, is now removed from the repository so now they have moved to completely a integrated solver called pimple form or pimple dim okay. form so uh -huh. so since i was not using any turbulence modeling i used icodim form which basically was kind of dns so based on your mesh sensitivity you can call it direct numerical simulation there was no turbulence model okay so how sensitive is this to the mesh discretization because uh, i mean block mesh is essentially like let's say a very crude thing right to start uh, yeah 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 so but, uh, so i will so i actually yeah i actually skip those slides i will go back yeah. okay sure. yeah so so here can you see my slide right yeah 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 so here you can see the grid sensitivity so basically right. i took a domain with 25 chord length uh, mm -hmm. and basically these points are basically number of points discretizing points on the airfoil okay okay so based on that the total number of cell changes so from we i have checked uh, for 400 which is converged which had some 5 to 6 lakh cells and mm -hmm. you can see that for 400 and 600 even the zoomed cases are completely matching mm -hmm. so mostly the sensitivity uh, changes in this peak regions or kings where your time history is jumping from one state to other state if you have low sensitivity i mean low number of grid points your uh, solutions will not match so maybe the average will match 
and but the instantaneous time history will not match so there is another trick to it your mm -hmm. slip gets converts very soon but your drag or thrust does not okay so this is a very important thing because the drag or thrust force calculations uh, uh, i mean its calculations uh, schemes require more sensitive bits so basically so i faced this question in one of my reviews so we sort the lift but reviewer told that i have previous experience that even if your lift matches your drag will not match so you have to show the match of the track so that is an important point for the beginners i see i see uh, i mean i think again just a beginner question that uh, that that lot of people lot of students might have is like uh, i mean when we go into the fluids it's mostly a finite volume method right i mean there are people using finite element but in yes. the domain people use more finite element uh, so why not finite element instead of finite volume that's a common question yeah yeah that's that's a, that's a very good debate and uh, yeah i would say that 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 myth has also been busted so there are many groups in uh, many indian organization like iit kanpur uh, i think uh, professor sanjay mittal is working actively in finite element codes and uh, i am also working i don't know whether uh, uh, Dr. Kardapa is here. Probably UK. It was very early, so he didn't join. So currently, I'm collaborating uh, with Dr. Kardapa in Swansea. So mm -hmm. we are basically developing one of the in-house codes. It's fully FSI and uh, it's completely finite element. Okay. Is this like an open source or something? Or uh, no. Currently, okay. it's in-house, but okay. uh, we. I mean, basically, it's he has developed it, and uh, we are working on the application in different fields, but. Okay. Uh, yeah we are talking we are discussing uh, if it's possible to make it open source but that's so there are existing codes uh, based on finite element let's say comsol mm -hmm. so comsol is completely finite element right but but when open form was started i mean from the starting they chose finite volume but in 2020 there is no such myth that finite volume is very good unless you validate with experiments and use proper discretization any schemes can give you correct results. I see, I see. But uh, how, how do they account for these uh, convecting terms and uh, diffusion terms, right? So that leads to a lot of oscillations, if I'm right, with finite elements. So what do you guys... Yes, so basically to account for that, uh, so mostly the approach should be like immersed boundary, where, uh, where basically the background valerian mesh is not deforming or remissing how i present it so it's still and uh, basically we are tracking the lagrangian markers of the body which is moving in the fluid flow right so at that point of time yeah i mean i i'm not a so hardcore cfd person so i can you i cannot tell you the schemes which takes care of that but uh, there are existing schemes of different uh, different uh, degree of accuracy which can take care of this Fourier oscillations so even for example for example let's say in open form so in open form immersed boundary solver is currently developing so every release they change the schemes they change the methodology so the current release there there is immersed boundary surface uh, methodology so where instead of immersed boundary cells we take care of a surface which is immersed in a Eulerian grid so okay. that I have tested and basically I'm presenting a talk in this recent open form conference uh, in the October. So there I would show those things. So basically I have seen that the spurious oscillations gets reduced to a significant extent. So okay. it depends on schemes and algorithms that you choose. Okay. But I think, yeah, Professor uh, Dr. Kadapa is not there. He could have you know, enlightened more because he has developed all these schemes. Okay, okay, interesting. That's nice to know. Uh, so are there any other questions? I mean, there, there are some other questions that I think some. No, I think uh, Professor Sachin had some questions. I mean, some chat, some questions were coming. Yeah, I think he has the same questions, uh, I think, uh, already. Okay. Uh, yeah. So I think there's another question. Can you suggest any flexible material that can be used in rotary wing applications such as helicopter to increase depth? Material, I'm a novice. I think you can answer that. 
I don't know. That, that, that uh, okay, so so I I basically worked with experiments involving very very flexible material. So let's say MFC, microfiber composite, or PVDF, which are normally piezo materials used for you know flapping wing applications or energy harvesting. But uh, you know rotary application, I really don't have much idea, so I don't want to comment on. It. I mean, uh, so how does the open form compare with regard to like answers, especially in scaling? I mean, uh, from what we saw, at least like once you have like 60, 70 processors, uh, it seems like open form starts to not do that great. And that's what we saw because we're using this for wind engineering, particularly for skyscrapers and also for like modeling tsunami events. Mm. Uh, so we, we had the issue where we like uh, once you reach some few tens of processors, it starts to uh, not do that well. So have you experienced anything like that with open form solvers? Or? Um, no, in that scale, I have not worked yet. So, and I really didn't work with ANSYS, so I don't have direct experience uh, okay. in comparison. Uh, but yeah, so this aspect we are going to study in detail. So we are actually submitting one proposal to for getting access to one UK supercomputer, mm -hmm. Cyrus. So, okay. so basically there we will have uh, probably we'll learn about it. So we will try open form to a huge number of scales. I see. Okay, interesting. I mean, I think this uh, that, that's pretty interesting because like I think uh, once you go into large scale application, then you need to kind of be able yeah. to run on like hundreds of processes. But I would say that every, uh, uh, so there is very active governing teams for each of the modules in open form and they are really active. And so at every release, they are, you know, making it improved. So, right. so there is a separate dedicated team for parallel operation of open form. So they are continuously work on improving the scaling performance of open form. So it's still developing. So with time, it's still getting better and better. Okay. But I also saw that open form kind of forked at some point, right? Recently they have this open form.org and open form.com. Uh, yeah. I, I mean, just, I, I think I mentioned that. Right. Uh, yeah, the three forks, I'll, because that is very important uh, to know. So this is the three forks that open form has. Right. So one is open form foundation and one is open form ESI open form. Right. So, so basically, yeah, I would say that uh, there is not much of difference and they are all interconnected, but the, I think uh, the focus was that one of the forks wanted to make it commercialized in near future. Mm -hmm. Another fork wanted to keep it open source forever. So this is the division. But uh, capability wise, I would say uh, different open form users in the community. Some people are fond of foundation version. Some people are fond of ESI version. Mm -hmm. But uh, and they have differences. So there are differences in some of the solvers. Like I said, in foam extent, you have some extra capabilities which normal open form version doesn't have. So it depends on your users and experience. So while working, you get fond to some version and you stick to it. So that kind of thing. But are more or are all of these more or less same? Uh, more or less same. same. More, more less all same. the basic solvers are same. Okay, I see. So so only some kind of advanced same. features that's like individual exactly. being developed. Exactly. Like because the uh, I mean community is slightly different. Some people keep developing on the foundation version. Some people keep developing on the open uh, open uh, CFD version. I mean the ESI version. Mm -hmm. And the foam extend version is uh, also, I mean, some some of the extra capability is there, uh, which is you know particularly developed with time uh, with some community. Like uh, I think Professor Cardiff is developing the fluid structure interaction part quite actively. Thank you, thank you. Interesting. Uh, I mean, uh, so let's say for a beginner student, uh, what would be the most easiest to start with? Easiest with flapping wing or easiest so with open form open form or CFD? CFD and open form. So what I would which, just which of three version should they choose, let's say, when they're starting out with? Yeah, so it's, as I said, in 2014, it was very difficult. But in 2020, it's not really difficult. So mm -hmm. if you just Google open form, you will get enough material. And mm -hmm. the first thing I would say that after installation, go to the user guide and there is a doc. And in that doc, there are a lot of example problems done. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, example uh, test cases 
all and every details are given there so in the open form within the folder itself there is a document which is very useful for the starter okay right. so so first thing would be that they should first go through all the tutorials then that itself make them self sufficient about open form because okay. open form tutorial uh, repository is very rich it has every kind of tutorial and the other link for the indian students i would say that iit bombay uh, fossi there is an organized project called fossi mm -hmm. uh, in iit bombay i can share the link later so they are basically now start, they have started making a repository of examples from different uh, students in india from different colleges who are interested in open form mm -hmm. so that is uh, there are summer fellowships available and there are uh, some case study based project available where student gets intensive also if the tutorial is good so and those will be you know uh, globally available over internet so anybody can go through the repository and download the tutorial and try that I so see. i think uh, the, even the airfoil examples are also there right so right. it's not a so there's a tutorial folder in which most of these things are there and one can just start with that i guess right exactly i mean it's not a uh, big deal now only thing is you should have a basic course of cfd before going into open form because that is the basic right so, otherwise it's just like you're turning out colorful pictures but you don't know what that means right yeah that's what i told that no black magic i mean right. this is a okay. lot of people do black magic with cfd right okay uh, i mean uh, so do you kind of uh, see flapping wings i mean one of the questions was how can flapping mechanism be a game changer in terms of commercial aviation uh, yeah as i told that uh, drone delivery right. the first option is drone delivery so mm -hmm. i know i have a friend uh, i i was recently discussing i have a friend in mit who is doing phd there so he is just finishing and looking for jobs so he told me that in us it is really a game changer like the delivery so now all the drone delivery has started uh, based on rotary system Mm -hmm. so which is kind of inefficient from power power wise and you know in urban setting as i said as i said so and also you know duration wise also so mm -hmm. if you want to deliver it through a drone you have limitation in duration in uh, altitude because some of somewhere it can get stuck and all this so all mm -hmm. those things are very futuristic and people are really even the corporate sector is really trying to get on this flapping drones right so that's the game rotary drone rotary drones are like kind of um, more explored at the moment i think flapping exactly that's because it's challenging it's complicated because maybe. yeah it's because it's complicated but with days research is coming on and a lot of research is happening in flapping wing i think in near future flapping drones will come up uh, people are working on that right interesting i mean uh, i i think that's more or less most of the questions that we had i think that you answered i, I think it's uh, probably we can uh, take one or two last questions if somebody has sure right out okay are there, are there any other questions that are there from the audience uh, hi, uh, i i i have a couple of questions this is yeah, uh, please go ahead sachin uh, sachin from iit kanpur so uh, thanks chandan for a very nice talk um my first question is about intermittency how did you define intermittency in your case and the second okay. question is about um, you said that at higher kh values in case of 3d foil uh, hmm. kos is sort of delayed yes uh, so do these uh, kh values are somewhere closer to what one can observe in natural flyers no that 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 i all uh, the second question i'll answer first the second question uh, for 3d as i said uh, in nature chaos is not observed till now hmm. so that that's the reason because uh, the natural flyers will not go for such higher strohal value okay so okay. that is one part uh -huh. second part is uh, i mean that's why experimentally also the second thing is experiment experimental observation of chaos in experiments hmm. some group like you know professor gursul groups from uk so they have observed so he has written a recently a review paper where he has mentioned about such chaotic flows but he has not mentioned that it is chaos so okay. that part we did and we established from the available nonlinear dynamics tools 
which are yes. used in nonlinear dynamics literature to prove that it's really a dynamical chaos. Mm -hmm. That is one point. Uh, so, so that answers your second question, right? So, yeah. nat in nature, natural fl uh, flyers do not go for such higher stall number. And the okay. second, co uh, first question that you showed, I will show the slide very clear. Okay. Yeah. So yes. So this slide I talked about intermittency. So here uh, I will just remind the initial dynamics was periodic, then it became quasi periodic, and yeah. then sporadic windows of aperiodicity appeared in between different periodic bursts. So basically, with time, you see an interplay or modulation of different two different dynamics in the same response which is defined as intermittency in dynamical system literature okay oh. and there are there are established local bifurcation routes from intermittency to chaos as someone already mentioned that in the normal quasi periodic re route what you see is periodicity quasi periodicity and then three frequency quasi periodicity and chaos so mm. that is normally happens for the hamiltonian system which is called the torus breaking route so in mm -hmm. quasi periodicity, you see a toroidal response in the phase space that breaks down and you get chaos. But and and the other uh, local intermittency route to chaos, what happens is uh, which happens through the saddle node bifurcation. You have a periodic response, then you have intermittency, which is a interplay between periodic and chaotic response, and then you get a robust chaos. Okay. However, in this case, because here flow and structure flow is completely nonlinear. We saw a, uh, we see a combination. So we see a quasi periodic route, but mm -hmm. which is also accompanied by intermittency before reaching to chaotic state. And interestingly, this chaotic uh, burst or the intermittency regimes are related to jet switching, <laughs> which is the major you know uh, finding from the flow patterns. So so also I uh, I think in last year I, uh, last year last to last year presented in APS DFD that this jet switching. Uh, phenomena, the rapid jet switching, which is basically equivalent to the sporadic aperiodic windows becomes frequent and frequent with the higher strohal number. And that leads to a complete aperiodic and chaotic flow field. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Jan. I think that, that's it. Yeah. Right. Oh. So if there are any other last questions, probably we can take them. Uh, I think we have taken a lot of time from Chandan and he has given like a lot of information about flapping wing and chaos and I think it was pretty interesting and I definitely learned a lot here because this is a new area for me. Uh, but before we kind of uh, uh, finish, I would just like to uh, uh, let you know about one of our next lectures. We'll be taking a break for a couple of weeks uh, and after that we will be returning on 4th of uh, uh september i think uh, if i got it right yeah so we'll be coming back on 4th of september and uh, professor vivek and prakash would be talking about uh, uh let's say marine animals i would say uh, to let's say to put it in a very simplistic sense this would be talking about how do insects float on water uh, we'll be shifting gas from uh, uh, air to water here and it's most of it's mostly an experimental work and pretty fascinating in there. I, you can uh, visit our website to kind of get an idea about uh, his work from the papers. Uh, please do join in. And if you do subscribe, uh, I will kind of let you know about uh, the upcoming lectures. Please uh, make sure to subscribe so that uh, you can be updated. I just wanted to let you know before people leave, uh, this is a very nice lecture and that will be coming on 4th of September. Till then, we'll be taking a break from the mechanics lecture series for a couple of weeks, and then we will be joining again. Uh, thank you very much, everybody, for joining. And I think it was a very uh, uh, engaging discussion on, on open form CFD, uh, nonlinear dynamics, chaos theory. Uh, it brings a lot of different aspects together, and I think that's the nice part of it. Uh, I, I'm, I definitely enjoyed it, and I hope all the uh, participants enjoyed it and I, I would thank uh, Chandan once again for uh, joining thank in you. and uh, giving this lecture. Uh, once again, thank